opportunity. There just was not a good week uh, with a lot of things in a lot of different ways. So um, next Sunday, we are going to go over the top for the dads, okay? I have no idea what we're going to do yet. I have no plan. I am going to talk to our staff, and uh, this next Sunday, we're going to do something very, very special. Because, you know, today you're going to feel special enough. So next Sunday, you're not going to feel special. Okay, so we're going to make you feel special next Sunday on the day when normally you would be back to normal and you wouldn't be feeling special. So we'll come up with something, but we're blessed that you're here this morning. If you look in the uh, bulletin here, um, there's a lot going on. And I mean, a lot. Uh, we've got Youth Summer Camp. Uh, you can see that Missio Day coming up July 12th through the 15th. We also have Kids Camp coming up the same exact time. And uh, you can see that at the bottom of the uh, uh, bulletin there on the left hand side as well so be mindful of those uh, events and the cost factors that are involved with them and uh, you can see vacation bible school again june 22nd through the 26th so again that's starting this again you want to say something you want to i saw that on the sign did you guys see that on the driveway on coming in there was a, a sign that said vacation bible school registration is full registration is closed so that old expression of uh, he who is first is last and he who is last is first doesn't apply in this situation. If you are last today, you are last and there is no, there is no signing up. So we apologize for that, but uh, that's a good problem to have. That means uh, that uh, what we set the expectations for and plan for. And the reason that has to happen is because obviously the, the be able to provide care for the kids that come and, and are, take part to not have a, uh, teacher student ratio that goes uh, way through the roof here where it just becomes babysitting and not discipleship uh, we've had to make those decisions and so hopefully uh, the Lord will be honored to that and your kids will be blessed as well so know that for vacation Bible school you can see Father's Day if you haven't purchased uh, your Father's Day gift there are items in the bookstore today 25% off and you can stop there after the service a couple things within uh, women's ministry, sister to sister there on June 30th, so mark your calendars for that, gals. And then we also have Comforting Moms as a ministry of our church, and you can read more about that there. Uh, Flood as an outreach, take a look and uh, find a place uh, to serve and get involved. And then, um, again, just thank you for being here uh, Thursday morning. I wasn't here, um, but uh, I, I was uh, incapacitated uh, just so that you know, I learned about all this stuff through social media. It's scary. Uh, I, I was involved in a traffic accident on Wednesday night on the way to church. And uh, so um, Thursday I was feeling the, the, the effects of uh, going from 60 to, to zero in about 2.3 seconds. It's not a ride at Magic Mountain that I would recommend. Uh, you know, they have like, the, what is it, Superman that, that sends you from like zero to 60 in a couple seconds, but you don't go from 60 to zero in a couple seconds. I had a, a, a gentleman accidentally uh, ran the stoplight there at uh, Old River and Ming, and we met in the intersection there. So it was a, a fun uh, event, and there's two totaled vehicles out of it, and, but uh, everybody's alive. That's the good thing. Sore, but alive. So with that, um, again, just want to encourage you, you know, as you've been doing, Fill these out. Boy, the last couple of weeks, I can't tell you how excited our staff was, our staff meetings to be able to, to sit and to pray over so many uh, of the prayer cards and praise reports that are coming in, and that's because of you. And so just a great big thank you. Uh, you. You don't know how much it means to us to be able to lift you in prayer. We can just pray generically, but boy, to get to pray specifically and then to pray uh, fervently and then to pray consistently uh, week in and week out and then to be able to praise the Lord with you because we serve a God that answers prayer and so I just want to encourage you today um, to uh, you know reach out and, and fill these out and let us pray with you and then if you'd like to get involved you can just communicate with us on the back there and uh, we will get in touch with you and uh, just know we have a, a, a baptism the last Sunday of the month so if you've yet to be baptized you can fill that card out and we'll be getting in touch with you this week some of you have filled that out and uh, we'll be making contact with you to uh, walk you through what's needed for that day. But we're really excited to be able to offer a baptism at the end of the month as well. So with that, I'll invite uh, the ushers to come forward this morning. And uh, we will receive our morning's tithes and offerings. And again, prayer requests and praise reports. So keep them coming. And again, thank you for your faithfulness in giving. 
You'll find over the summer months as uh, people are out of church and on vacation, be in prayer for them as well. And if you uh, take a vacation, I always like to remind you, vacations are great and they're needed, but uh, don't take a vacation from God. You know, uh, find another uh, church, attend it, and uh, wherever you're at, uh, serve the Lord there and, and be blessed. And you'll find that it's really exciting. I'm always encouraged when we have families that travel uh, from out of the area and that visit with us. Uh, we had uh, some families from uh, Whittier here last Sunday that were here on vacation and just in service. And so it's neat to hear from them after the service. And, and we had the group from Washington, or excuse me, from Oregon that was coming through. We've got a group from Washington coming through. So it's just neat over the summer months. But uh, as you're traveling about, <clears throat> just make sure, you know, people go, well, I don't feel comfortable, you know. Um, that's where we just need to get outside of ourselves because what a blessing we can be to other people when we enter into fellowship with them and then to obviously uh, worship our Lord and we can do that in a lot of different places so I just really want to encourage you with all my heart to uh, make sure you're in church over the summer months it's not legalism it's it's relational it's a relationship that we get to enjoy and with that um, I will invite you then if you have a Bible handy this morning since it's Father's Day uh, we, I thought we'd just read the whole Bible today just uh, start and spend the day just loving our Heavenly Father. Amen. Just what a gift we could give him. Now we're going to be in the book of Ephesians today. If you have a, a Bible handy, we're going to take a break from our study in Revelation here. We will finish the book of Revelation here shortly, but uh, we'll stretch it out for a couple more weeks anyway. And we'll be in Ephesians chapter 6 here this morning. We're going to read verses 1 through 4 together. And then uh, we'll take a moment here and pray. And so if you have a Bible, I'll invite you to open it there. If you don't own a Bible and you need one, just raise your hand and our ushers will find you and bless you with a copy. Or you can just follow along as you always do on the screen behind me as well. <clears throat> when you find that, go ahead and stand to your feet and in reverence and honor to our Heavenly Father today who we celebrate each and every Sunday when we come into this place. We'll read this aloud together and then uh, take a moment like I said and pray and ask the Lord to magnify his name in this service today it says in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1 it says children <clears throat> obey your parents in the Lord for this is right honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord let's take a moment and pray Father, we thank you again for Father's Day and what a perfect Father we have in you, perfect in all of your ways. And so, Lord, no matter what our relationship might have been or might be with our earthly father, uh, Lord, thank you that we have a heavenly father who is there for us 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, who your word declares that you supply all of our needs to your riches and glory that are in Christ. You know what our wants are. You don't give us all of our wants, but Lord, you provide faithfully, day in and day out, all that we need. The air that we breathe, the food that we eat, the drink that we place into our body, the homes in which we live in, the car, possessions that we own. Your word declares that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. That Lord, you are such a blessing, God. And today, Lord, even if you didn't give us anything, Lord, you are still worthy to be praised. Even if you cast each and every one of us into hell, Lord, for all eternity, you would still be worthy of praise. And so, Lord, today, as we study your word and we talk about our earthly fathers, Lord, may we understand and know that our earthly fathers are simply, in the best of their ability, a reflection of our heavenly father. And so, Lord, we thank you. For you we thank you for your son we thank you for the gift of your holy spirit and we thank you for our fathers again today we pray again that they would grow in the knowledge of god that they would be conformed uh, into your image lord as they're transformed by the renewing of their mind we love you we give you this day we invite you to speak to each of our hearts fathers sons mothers daughters sisters brothers alike thank you for your living word Lord, minister to us now, Lord, as we minister to you, as we pray in Jesus' name. And we all agreed this morning saying amen. Amen. You can be seated. You know, I remember <clears throat> when I was a youth pastor, I, like I've shared before, I got to do uh, 
all these special services like Father's Day, Mother's Day, and our senior pastor would take vacations on, on major holidays, and so that was the time. So I got to preach in the sanctuary, you know, a couple, two or three times a year, <clears throat> or if he got sick, and I didn't poison his food that often. But, um, you know, it was always fun, especially on Mother's Day and Father's Day. And I remember the very first Father's Day that I did, and I was really excited about it until I went to Webster's Dictionary. And when I went to Webster's Dictionary, I looked up the word, you know, father. And it wasn't the definition, because everybody knew the definition, right? You know, the father, I mean, what a father is, you know, is that the male species, you know, the legal, you know, medical definition, you know, who, and, you know, sires a, a child, you know, into this world, blah, 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 you go, know, all these things. And you go, it doesn't have the, that oomph to it, you know, that we'd all kind of hope for. It just seems like, eh, just kind of generic to the point. But the thing where the Holy Spirit got a hold of my heart is when I was looking at the word father and I noticed right above it, it was the word fathead. And then I looked below it and it said fatigue. And I thought, man, what a, that's the definition of what it is to be a father. It falls somewhere between fathead and fatigue. I think most of us who are dads, we go, a lot of times we just feel like, man, I did not, if we're honest, you know, you go, it is not an easy thing to, to be a dad. And sometimes in the decisions we make and the things that we do, I go, man, I feel like a fathead. And then you go, hey, otherwise it just wears you out. And you go, no, I understand, you know, fatigue there. And so when I think about, you know, this Father's Day, uh, again, really nothing changes throughout life. I mean, one of the, the great blessings of, of uh, being a grandfather is uh, you get kind of a do-over, you know, and I love that. Uh, we had our father, son, father, daughter, camp out this weekend there was like 50 uh, uh, men and kids at Walker Basin and my son uh, Brett and Brandon were both there and and uh, Brett brought uh, our granddaughter uh, Reese and we were playing in the trailer and it was just one of these things and it was so funny because uh, she would step up on the, the top step of where the goes up to where the the bedroom is and uh, I put a, a floor mat, you know, on the ground because uh, Brandon slept on the, the floor. Brett and Reese got the bed, and I slept on the, the um, I don't know what you would call it. It wasn't a bed. It was a pullout um, thing. It was kind of like a burrito wrapper is all I could kind of say that it was because it has poles like right in the middle of your shoulders and your lower back. And it's, it really, it has all these signs about like, you know, like, things that are going to kill you by laying down on this thing. And that's really what it was a death sleep is what it was. And so Brandon had the better of the deal. He was on the little fold out mattress on the ground. Well, Reese wanted to jump on that, you know, and I was thinking about, you know, what do moms do in moments like this? Cause they'll examine the, the trailer. And I did that and I saw there was an edge on the corner and I'm thinking, okay, if I put this here and let her jump, she could, you know, flop over there and hit her head right on that corner. And, if there was any kid that was capable of doing it, it's going to be Reese because it's just, you know, what I thought it's going to happen. But she wanted to do it, you know, and you go, and what, what's one of the great things about being a dad is you're a risk taker, right? Risk. Moms are not into risk at all. It's, they're, they're into risk management. You know, it's like studying everything. And that's why we don't invite moms to go on this trip. There's things that happen there that, you know, we say what happens in Baker Pond stays at Baker Pond. It doesn't, though, because of social media. People come home, they start posting up things, you know, like it was so cool riding the ATVs through the archery course. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm going, okay, that's not really how it happened, okay? You know, uh, it was so cool to see guys shooting BB guns in one direction and, and arrows in the other. You know, it was like, like this was some civil war or something, you know, the uh, American Indian Revolution or something. I don't know. It was like, I'm going, it didn't really go down like that. But uh, there's risk involved. And so Reese gets up there and she's like, Opa, I want to uh, jump, jump. So I would hold her hands for a second. And she would just jump. I had her by the hands and she would jump from the top down to the bottom. And then she would laugh and we'd play. And then, then she got brave and she wanted to dive. So then I let her up there and I'm thinking, okay, so I'm looking around. I'm like, you know, this could go bad, but you know, we just have to trust that, you know, because everybody, you could say that, then don't get out of bed in the morning. I mean, and even if you do, it could, you could hurt your back, right? So it, there's going to be risk involved. And dads are just willing and grandpas, you know, oh, pause to risk. So she got up there and, man, she dove off that thing, which is not really characteristic for her. So it was kind of fun. And she just kept doing that. And that just became one of those things where 
It was the silliest thing. And then she wanted me to do it. And that's when, that's when the man sets in. Because then you're going, it's one thing for your, your granddaughter to get up on the top step of a two-step trailer and dive onto uh, a you know, little mat on the ground. But it's another thing you know, when she's looking at you, Opa, you jump. Opa, you jump. And I'm like, reach. And I'm trying to give her you know, two years old explanations why opas don't jump off of you know, steps onto the thing. But what do I find myself doing? You know, next thing I know, opa's jumping off the, the top step you know, onto the mat, not wanting to. And it's not definitely very comfortable you know, in the sense. Of, but she is laughing like, I'll get out. And I'm going, if she's going to laugh and have fun, we're going to keep doing this. But I kept thinking back. I was going, Man, I wouldn't have done that for my own kids. I was like, hey, listen, you know what? You guys jump off there. Not to just reason with them, you know? You can jump off there, but you know what? I am not going to look ridiculous jumping off this thing, making a fool of myself. Kids, that's your job because you're kids, and kids do foolish things. But dads, we don't do foolish things. And so the next thing you know, as an opa, you're doing really, really foolish things, you know? And you just you jump off. And and, uh, and my son, of course, what is he doing? He's videotaping, you know? And so you just have, there, there's no, it's just, you just go with the flow because that's just the way that it is. But it's a, it's a special relationship. You know, like, uh, I, I want you to understand something here today, especially for you dads. It, it doesn't take much. I mean, I, all life is a miracle, and I want you to think about this. All life is a, truly a miracle from God, amen? But part of being male is we can cause a pregnancy to take place. One of the things I love you know, in a church is when I see women come into the church and they've got these bellies with, you can just see the, their belly buttons sticking out. They've got an Audi going, you know, because they're just pregnant with this baby. Lee and I were at dinner the other night and the little waitress, I mean, you can see she was probably all of, I mean, I'm not kidding. She probably couldn't have weighed 80 pounds total. And she had this just cute little tiny it was like one of those three three dollar watermelons you get it fresh and easy you know it was just like this thing right in front but it had an audi you know uh, on her her navel so i was at first i was you know i didn't go well maybe i shouldn't say something and i've learned from other people and they go don't even don't if you don't know them don't guess don't 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 speculate definitely don't assume so i would but i wanted to say because she looked so cute and i finally figured out i know it was a pregnancy but i i was just scared I wasn't going to say, hey, you know, are you pregnant? You know, and is, oh, you must be with child. But there's something that is it's just so beautiful about a pregnant woman. There's probably no, no greater moment in her life where she's more radiant than on her wedding day and when she's carrying a baby. And I think especially in carrying a baby, that's just a gift from God because in talking to women, that you don't feel very comfortable, you know, during a pregnancy. So to look beautiful, uh, that's a gift from the Lord. But I know that men can impregnate women. And so it doesn't take, in the sense, you know, much to to bring a child into this world and we see it because there's so many single parent homes today we call them you know deadbeat dads and things like that and this isn't a you know a sermon about those things today it's a celebration of fathers but see to create a legacy to be truly a father to be a dad uh, is so much more than impregnating a woman it's a special relationship between father and child and it's a relationship that all of us can enjoy today in our relationship with the lord he's not just you know again we don't talk about god as being male we see him as our jesus said when you you know this manner when you pray our what father who art in heaven he didn't just give us life but he's there for us and and i so appreciated the dads that took the time you know it's like when we've had the daddy daughter dance you know at our church and and uh, I've talked to women that are my wife's age and older that, man, there's just, it doesn't, it never changes in your life. I mean, to be chosen and to be made, you know, f- to feel special by your father, there's, there's nothing that can compare to that. It's more than, you know, any gift, uh, present that you would give. You know, we say this, you know, often, how do kids spell love? T-I-M-E. And again that doesn't change you know with age you think oh she's older now she's got a husband and she's got her own children but to be loved by her father there there is no there is no comparison to that and in that special bond that exists and so we try to plan ministry that way that can help men move from just being the male species of impregnating a woman and bringing a child into the world to becoming a dad learning how to be a father 
to share those moments. And it was so fun to, to be with the dads there yesterday and to watch them. And Squeak came up and led worship for us on Friday night. And I so appreciate him, not just the, the gifts that he has and the sacrifice of just coming up and stuff, but his, his gift in understanding uh, worship. And, and uh, he, you know, he was like, well, what song should we do? And I said, well, I'll just trust you, pray about it. You know what you feel like the Lord would have you do? And he sent me this list. And it was just perfect, and I didn't say anything to him. I just wrote the word perfect, you know, just so that it was didn't need to change anything. And it was just what I thought. I was sitting there in the back, and I was watching uh, uh, Squeak lead them in, and, and we were singing Father Abraham. And if you know Father Abraham, you know, as many sons, as many sons as Father Abraham, right arm, left arm, you got, and I'm going, okay, here's where we're going to see. Who, this is going to separate the men, you know, from the boys right here. And it was like every dad there was participating. And it was so fun. There was dirt going everywhere when they went in the circle. And, you know, you were singing and eating dirt. And it was just like, it was just one of those moments where, you know, if we could have had a camera that could have captured it. It was just so sweet. And I was sharing with the guys, you know, that, again, you know, a, a dad or a father, he, and we talk about the word legacy here a lot in the life of our church. I, I coined that a phrase uh, the day that uh, when Danielle Gould went home to be with the Lord and I was sitting there with Tink and Cheryl and, and Cheryl had made the statement, you know, never forget uh, Danielle. And I remember the Lord just impressed this on my heart in that very moment. And it was the thought or what a legacy is, you know, that a legacy for, for many people is, is that thing that you leave behind for other people to carry on. And that's what they think of a legacy is, but a true legacy and it's what we're really, th this chapter really speaks to. A, a true legacy, and I coined the phrase, was a true legacy is the part of you that lives on in those you leave behind. So it's not something that you leave for others to do. It's the part of you that then gets carried on in the life of those that you love. And so we have a very little time. You know, I'm 55, and I think, man, life has just flown by. And the moments that I've had with my kids and they're faint memories. You know, you think of just things that you did. And I'm not talking about, you know, I, I coached them in sports and stuff like that. And that, that's all well and good, and it's very good. But I'm talking about those moments, you know, of just where it's, you know, father, son, father, daughter, and those things that you would just cherish with them uh, and helping them understand who they are in the Lord. And so to have those kind of weekends, uh, it was just such a, a blessing, you know, to see so many guys, you know, that came up there and uh, really ministered to their kids. And the memories are so funny. I mean, the pond is down, obviously because of the drought. And so Bob Heavily, our neighbor up there, he said, well, be careful going down to the pond because uh, it's like quicksand, you know, around the pond there. And, uh, you know, you'll, you can step in and it wouldn't go, you know, more than a, about 10 or 12 inches, you know, deep. But it's that gooey mud if you've ever... It just like, you know, just you can hear it and it grabs hold of you and it doesn't let go. And so just to kind of, well, how do I say this? Um, if your kids came home and they didn't have any shoes or they had one shoe maybe because we had a few of those, um, they're still up at the pond. They're not lost. Um, we're going to wait and hopefully, uh, we'll get some water this next year and they'll float back to the top and then you'll, you'll get them back. But, uh, it was just so cool to see these kids and a couple dads come out of there with one shoe on and no shoes on and just, you know, and just people just cracking up. They go, Oh, were you swallowed up by the pond? You go, yeah, dad, the pond got me, you know, it's just, I mean, this things that it was just so, so sweet. And, and again, hopefully today, you know, the Lord will provide for you some, great opportunity to have some of these memories uh, to make with your own kids or your grandkids today. If you read this with me, it says in verse one, it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and may live long on the earth. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training, the admonition of the Lord. So it's just this, this tiny piece of, of texture that's so profound because I mean, you think about this, the Apostle Paul wrote these letters, right, to these different churches, and so that he would send these letters, and people would, you know, get them, and those that were in charge, the elders and the leaders of, of the church there, and the whole community would come out. They didn't have church like we have it today. They didn't have a nursery, you know, then a children's church, then a youth service. I mean, everybody just came out. You brought your goat, your, you know, you brought your cows, everything. It was just like being at Walker Basin. It was just cool. 
you, you're there and, and they're reading this letter and and you're thinking well it's just to the parents you know what's that old expression you know about children children are to be what seen and not heard how many have ever had that expression shared with them by an elderly person yeah, a couple of us have and you know how many of you actually have repeated that to to children most everybody has at some point but if you think about this this letter uh, again the apostle paul isn't just he doesn't start with like the dad you'd think and and then go to the mom and then the oldest sibling work his way down he starts with the kids here I mean, that would have got their attention. Hey, God's got something to say to me. And he does. And he said, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And again, he's expressing this to kids. They were there. They were in the service. They were listening. You ever heard that expression, the, the family that prays together stays together? And it's so true. And I want to encourage you, you know, to have your kids with you, you know, in service as you can. And sometimes it's difficult because of their age and obviously because of you know, the context of the sermon and things like that. But as, as you train your children, you know, to be with you in service, that it's not that they're going to necessarily get anything out of, when we talk about this, we want age-appropriate ministry, and we do. But there's times when if you'll be in the service with your kids, they're doing what? Because we know this. People, in general, we learn more by what? By what we hear or by what we see? So if your kids are in church with you and you go, I don't want my kids in church with me because I'll just be playing on my cell phone the whole time I'm in church or I'm doing this and, and they're, they're watching you. Are we modeling, you know, a faith that's real? Do we have a Bible? Do we bring the Bible to church with us? I mean, because these are all things that get handed down. We go, ah, you know, I just, I just listen. And they go, that's okay. You go, but somebody's watching you. Somebody's watching you. Not just your kids. Other people are watching you as well. And they're watching, you know, how you are attentive to the Lord, the things of God. And so he speaks to the, the children here. He uses a word there for children. It's the word technon. And it applies to kids of any age that are living under the roof of their parents. So if you're living at home, it doesn't make any difference. It's not like, well, I'm an adult now. You go, if you're living under your parents' roof, then this applies to you. The word there, obey, is the Greek word hupakuo. It's H-U-P-A-K-O-U-O. And it speaks of a, a soldier who's getting instruction, who's about ready to go into battle. And if you knew that your life depended on it, would you be listening to what your superior officer was saying to you? I, I love sports and, and football in particular. And I'm always amazed at, and I tell my wife this sometimes, because she goes, honey, are you going to watch the game? And I go, yeah, I'm going to watch the last two minutes when the game starts. And because it seems like the game just kind of goes, and, 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 and all of a sudden it gets down to the two minute what? Warning. And then it's like the game starts. And all of a sudden they get serious. I mean, teams haven't moved the ball at all. And all of a sudden they do what? They huddle up and they listen finally to the quarterback. They do what the quarterback says in the huddle. And this is exactly what the word obey means. It means to be with intention. That you're going as if your life depended on it and again there is an out here you know if, again we go so we're just supposed to listen to everything that our parents say and you go no because it says in the lord right in the lord so when your parents instruction goes against the word of the lord again do you have to listen and obey it no that would be called civil disobedience could you suffer for it probably are going to but it's worth it in the end. Some parents will say, and maybe you've heard this, some of you have used this, you know, parents are, are, are great at saying, I'm the parent. And your kids go, why should I do that? Why are we doing this? And you go, because I'm the parent. Don't ask why, I'm the parent. And we'd say, oh, I hated when my parents said that. And then if you have kids and your kids go, mom, dad, why are we doing that? Listen, I'm the parent. It was like, the, all of a sudden it was like, yeah, finally I arrived. Yes, I got to say it. You know, I'm the parent. And you go, what does that mean? I have no idea. But it just, it just gives me the ability when I don't want to answer a question or I don't know the answer, I just say, I'm the parent. Or, you know, you go, in my case, I go ask your mother. <laughs> it's always the thing. Oh, you, she didn't know that? Well, okay, and then it gives you time to Google it. And then you can look it up. And, oh, mom didn't know the answer? Here, honey, well, this is all. I'm just trying to help mom feel really special and smart. But, you know, obviously she's in the kitchen slaving away while I'm sitting here in front of the TV set. So... Um, you know, but now we're all caught up. But, you know, you think about this because of parents and the influence they have on their kids. And we're called to honor our parents and to obey them. And I think about this because in Walker Basin, we had a, there was a couple instances. We actually had two, 
couple things this week. Friday, I said all this stuff out behind the, the church over here, and uh, I was talking with Squeak via text, and they were taking some of the stuff up, and then I was taking some of the stuff, and we were going to load it all up. And so when I came to, back to the church to get everybody, there was a pop-up tent out behind the, the building, which I had placed there. So I thought, okay, well, they got all the other stuff, and so then I'll just get the pop-up tent through it in the truck, and we got up there. So we got up there. I said, hey, Martin, I said, can I have the tables? And uh, he goes, what tables? And I said, well, the tables that I put out in the back there with all the other stuff. And he goes, uh, I didn't take anything. And I'm like, you're kidding me. So somewhere between 10 and noon, somebody stole two tables, a coffee pot, the cups, the utensils, all the stuff that we needed for Walker Basin was in two hours was gone. They didn't take one pop-up tent, though. That was very kind of them because we did need that because it got hot during the day. would have been nice to have the other one, too. And you should have seen the way they did coffee. Coffee was like they called it uh, like cowboy coffee or something. But it was uh, we took uh, uh, Daniel Harrison. He'd lost his shoe in the pond. We just took his sock, put it over a thing, and then poured the boiling coffee, filtered it through his Dirty son, no, we didn't. It was, that would have been cool. Uh, we did. It was worse than that. Shane did it, and I don't know what he did, but it was just. It didn't look good. Just put it that way, and and not very many people. Only people with addictions to coffee even attempted to to drink it because they were just like, I don't care. Just give me some. I was like, I'm going okay. It's just not going to be good. But uh, that's a whole nother sermon, like I said. But somebody stole all the stuff. You know, so we're going, but. Then we get to Walker Basin, and I'm looking at this piece of property that's right next to ours, and all the barbed wire fence is gone. And I'm thinking, why is the barbed wire fence gone? So I asked Bob, and he goes, oh, this guy who has a fence company sends his kids out at night. He goes, because they've watched them. And they, they come, and they take the fence down, and they take all the posts home, and then they take them and paint them at night, and then they use them on jobs. And he's telling me this. And I said, well, didn't you call the cops? And they go, yeah. And they go, but the cops just say, well, they're just miners. All they're going to do is basically because of what's going on in our world today, they're just going to you know, put them in the custody of their parents and tell them to take them home. I'm like, you're kidding me. And this is when a child should stand up and go, listen, Dad, uh, I don't care how hard business is. I'm not going to go steal bob wire fence. You know, thou shalt what? Not steal. I'm not going to steal the bob wire fence off the neighbor's fence. And then another guy, and there's another family up there, uh, this guy does all kinds of stuff. Well, they caught him. He drops his kids off. His kids walk through the area where our pond's at, and they throw um, something into the pond because we feed the, the fish up there. They threw stuff into the fish, and about 60 fish came up dead. And uh, so they poisoned the fish. Well, the kids did it, though. And then they said, we saw him. And they said he dropped his kids off on one side. They walked through. They threw stuff into the pond because they have cameras and everything up there. And then the dad drove around to the other side of the pond. The kids get in the car. And I said, well, why, why did they do that? And he goes, because the kids aren't going to get in trouble. They go, it's the idiot parents, you know, because the court system, they go, well, what are we going to do, put them in juvenile hall? We're we going to overload everything. And they go, it's just unfortunately what happens is, you know, stupidity rolls downhill, you know, as they say. And so it's just an unfortunate situation. But this is where the Lord says, if your parents are calling you to do something like that, then you don't have to go along with it. You know, stand up, uh, do the things that are right. And that's hard because you want to, please your father. You want to be pleasing to people. It's just something within us that God's created. Verse 2 goes on. It says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And again, there's two explanations for this thought here. You know, which is the first commandment with promise? It was comedian Bill Cosby who gave us the, the first example of this in verse 2 when he, he told his sons why they should obey him. He said, I brought you into this world. I can take you out. So I think that, that kind of, that's a great explanation as to what this means. And biblically speaking, it comes from Leviticus chapter 20, verse 9. It says, For everyone who curses his father or mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or mother. His blood shall be upon him. So the child here that commits this crime does so with knowledge and intent. Okay, They know what they were supposed to do, and they, they rebelled. They purposely went away from what their parents instructed them to do and they wouldn't do it. That's when we talk about corporal punishment in the life of a child. We should not spank our children for making mistakes. We should 100% of the time spank our children when they get in our face and say, no, I'm not going to do it, when they willfully disobey you. We have so many parents, okay, that's a timeout. <laughs> no, that's hell. 
Uh, that, that's hell. You know, if you do not correct your children, you might as well, you, the Bible says, and this is hard for parents because we have so much psychology today that says, no, 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 just talk to them, reason with them as if God doesn't understand your child, that God hasn't given us his word. God hasn't given us instruction as to how to train. And I'm not talking about beating our children. I'm talking about training our children in the way that they should go. And when you think about this, I mean, I don't know too many parents have ever taken their kids to uh, a, a stealing class. I don't think, hey, Saturday we're having a stealing class down at the Y. I'm going to take you down there. Uh, they're having a lying class or a coveting class. You know, you don't have to train your children to be sinners. They, they have a, a sin nature. We all have a sin nature. Again, I'm not a sinner because I sin. I sin because I'm a sinner. So the Bible says we are to train our children in the way that they should go. Deuteronomy 21.18 puts it like this. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them, and his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of the city, and they shall say to the elders of the city, this son of ours, his stubborn and rebellious, he will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and all of Israel shall hear and fear. So this is talking about a, a child who isn't making mistakes. This is a child who's living in open rebellion against his parents, who willfully disobeys them, who's bringing shame and also Again, not just shame when you think about this. I mean, but also harm to a family structure. And so the Bible obviously provides for this. And so the elders of that city would join the family in carrying out this sentence. Now, the parents had to be the first to throw the stone. It's what Jesus in John chapter 8, if you remember the story about the woman who was caught in adultery. And Jesus, again, he stoops down and he writes in the sand, right? Because he tells him, he says, you know, ye who knows no sin, let him be the first to cast the stone. This is referring back to both Deuteronomy and Leviticus. So when someone was accused of a crime of this nature, they, the elders didn't go, okay, well, hey, bring your, your son here and uh, we'll stone him to death. They said, you have to throw the first stone and then we will join with you in agreement. That's why it's still in practice today. If someone is accused and, and found guilty of a capital crime, what do we say when they go to trial? It doesn't say that no one can... Uh, take someone to court for a capital crime. It becomes a crime of the state. It'll, if there's a murder in the state of California, it wouldn't be, you know, Mike Ostheimer versus somebody, say they killed somebody in my family. It would be the state of California versus the person who's accused. So this comes straight from the scripture. I mean, our, our laws in the United States of America come right from the Bible itself. And so Jesus here tells them, he says, hey, you, you know, you who know no sin, let him be the first to cast the stone. So there was a responsibility that came with that. And again, it's one, again, that you don't just have a bad day as a parent and go, hey, listen, you know, if you don't knock it off, you know, a mom who's, you know, I, I, I follow, you know, Ruthie on, uh, and Squeak on Instagram, and I see pictures, you know, of all the kids and trying to get them to, you know, trying to just to get one to play in the right way is no one thing. But when you get one that gets a, a marker in their hand and and then, you know, they go to town on each other and all over the house. I mean, I don't care what kind of day you're having. That can take its toll on you. And if you could just make that decision in that moment, as, as, as sweet as Ruthie is, I bet in her mind she could probably go there for a second and go, you know what, if uh, this was biblically permissible, I would take you to the elders of the church and have them just, to, you know, I'd get a do-over, <laughs> you know, and, and just eliminate you. But you go, thank God that, you know, in those moments you go, okay, you know, Squeak comes to the rescue and helps her out, and then she gets to rest, and then you wake up the next day and you just love them all over again, right? But, man, that's why in Scripture you've got to be really careful. And so there's safeguards within it because God knows our hearts as well, even as parents. It gets very, very tiring, and we see so much abuse in the world today. Verse 3 goes on, it says, that it may be well with you that you may live long on the earth. And again, in Exodus 20, 12, God instructed Moses there with the Ten Commandments. He says in verse 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. So the life of an obedient child, you could say, is rich in quality, but not necessarily long in quantity. Because there's going to be a peace. When you're living at peace with your parents because you're bringing joy to their life, 
you're going to experience joy in your life. It's the same thing in our relationship with our Heavenly Father, right? When you know that you're living right with God, that doesn't fix your, your circumstances of life. But man, there's a peace that comes with it. There's a joy that just goes, hey, I know my dad's happy. You know, my dad used to tell me all the time, he says, honey, I don't care if you get first or second place or third place. You know, what I care is that you just do the best job that you possibly can. And I would tell my boys the same thing. You know, it's not about winning and losing per se. It's did you give 100%? You know, are you doing the best job that you possibly can do? And so when it's stressing this, you know, here, again, is that there is a blessing that comes with obeying your parents. And it's called stress-free living. It's not that, you know, again, you're just going to live a long time because there is no guarantee of that. But the, the quality of your life, is going to be rich is what the Lord is declaring. And that's true for all of us, you know, in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Verse 4, and it really is the whole focus of this, it says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training, the admonition of the Lord. And I find, you know, this really interesting in light of Ephesians chapter 5, because Paul's dealing with marriage here in a very, very specific way. He talks about the roles and the responsibilities of marriage, right? And I'm not going to go through it, but think about this. He first talks about the need for all of us in relationship. This is for parents too today, is the need in chapter 5 to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to be bipolar in your parenting. You'll have days when you're good, and you're going to have days when you're really bad. And it's just part of human nature because we don't have any consistency because we don't have a strength that's outside of ourselves and so everything's predicated by what emotion and feeling and circumstance as long as everything's going good life is good at home that's where we get the the term what eggshells you ever walked on eggshells in your home well you won't walk on eggshells in a home where mom and dad are filled with the holy spirit And that's why he speaks of this in Ephesians chapter 5. Then he goes into the roles and responsibilities of marriage. He talks about husbands loving their wives like Christ loved the church. Talks about wives respecting their husbands. And it's a beautiful relationship, right? So, So the Apostle Paul, he knows how to speak to men and to women. But then isn't it interesting when you look here in chapter 6, what does he do? Does he address women at all? No. And you go, wait, did he make a mistake here? How come he didn't say, you know, you mothers, you know, do this and this in in responsibility in the home? You go, because God sees family the way that we don't see family. God sees a hierarchy, a structure, even to this very day, that is so contrary to the world's ways. That the husband, the father, is to be the head of his household. He's to be the primary means of instruction in that home, even more so than his wife. The wife is what? She comes under the leadership and the headship of her husband. And I can't stress to you enough, all you have to do is go study psychology and find today the troubles that we're facing as a nation here in the United States. Don't look at even at the rest of the world. Just focus here on the United States of America. We've taken the Bible out of schools. We've taken prayer out of schools. We've taken God out of life in general. And you go, and we're, we're, we're just saying, find yourself, discover yourself. And, and if the world has ever been, you know, messed up, it, 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 I mean, it can't compare to where it is today. Because this is what happens when God is not the center of your home. Maybe he's not the center of your life. You have mass confusion here. And so the Apostle Paul He's dealing with this situation, but he's making it really clear about who's responsible. And that is, again, the father. That is the husband. And again, he doesn't address moms. And some will say, well, that's because women by by nature nurture. But it doesn't say that. And so, again, that would be adding something to the scripture here. What we have to do is just take the scripture for what it's saying. Again, when I, I think about this, is it an oversight? And I don't think it is. He writes this, and you fathers, he says, do not provoke your children to wrath. He says, and you fathers. Like I said, almost any man can cause a pregnancy, but only a father can leave a legacy. And I really want to encourage you, you know, dads, to focus on that, a legacy. What is it that, again, you think about this today, I and mean, it's very personal. It's not something you have to share. But what is it that your life is leaving in the life of your kids? What, what are your kids when you die? What are they going to say about you? Because here's the neat thing. You can start living your life in such a way that they say those things about you. And it doesn't matter what you did in the past. It can start today. Like I share you know, 
very often from this pulpit. You know, the best time to plant a shade tree was 25 years ago, but the second best day is today. Again, the mercies of God are new every morning, is to think that through. And so much of what the devil does is rip us off and go, well, my kids are grown now. Hey, they're still your kids, and they'll always be your kids until the day that either you go home to be with the Lord or they go home to be with the Lord. But they, they're your responsibility. And God doesn't ever call us as fathers to relinquish that to anybody else in, in this world. And again, God designed the family to work best through a loving husband and a loving father to take responsibility for the shepherding of his home. This wasn't to be left to the moms. Uh, again, it's a joint effort, but it's under the loving care uh, of a husband and father. Again, uh, I love this illustration. It was a Sunday school class where a teacher asked the kids to draw a picture of God. One child portrayed God as a brightly colored rainbow. Another child drew him as an old man coming out of the clouds. And still another little boy drew God with a strong resemblance to Superman. But the best sketch came from a little girl who said, I don't know what God looks like, so I just drew a picture of my daddy. And again, when you think about that, that's why I say, you know, father, father's role, they're big shoes to fill. For better or for worse, a child learns about God first and foremost by looking at the character of their father of their dad. They're going to learn more about, you're going to influence your child for better or for worse by your life, your lifestyle. That word provoke here, it means to discourage. Colossians 3.21 says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And so the question becomes, how do dads discourage their kids? And it's by placing unrealistic expectations on them. See, a lot of dads and a lot of moms are guilty of this. They try to live their life vicariously through their kids. They want their kids to succeed in the areas where they failed. So they push them and they drive them. And yet the Bible says that's how you discourage your kids. Because, see, they, they say, well, but I want better. You know, and that's the, the justification. But, again, it's still wrong. You know, our children, they're not ours. That's where we have to begin. Dad, they, your kids don't belong to you. You know, we say, my kids. And I get that. But Psalm 127.3 says, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. See, the latter part of verse 4, Paul writes this, but bring them up in the training, the admonition of the Lord. Bring them up means to train them. Training, admonition, it's the word nurture. That's really important here because nurture involves both correction and which is corporal punishment and verbal instruction. Okay, it's not one without the other. It's actually both of those. It's explaining to your children that you love them. You know, my dad used to... When he'd, he'd give me a spank and he'd say, you know, Michael, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And I was like, well, let me have the hairbrush and I'll, 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 I'll be the, the judge of that. But when you have your own kids, you get it. You understand it because you don't take any pleasure in it. And so you explain to them and you say, you know what, I, I want you to understand why daddy has to do this. Because if I don't do this, the Bible says I'm not loving you. And you don't want to do it. If you're, if you're a loving father, the last thing you ever want to do is put your hands on your own kids. And the devil doesn't want you to either. And if you think about this and you go, why? And you go, because God, in the truest sense, had to put his hands on his own son. The Bible says, for God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son. And I'll tell you, if there's anything I resent, it's a parent who tries to tell me today that, you know what, I've read these books. And I'm going, well... If you knew how close you are to blasphemy of the Holy Spirit when you start saying you don't need to do the things that God calls you to do, when God gave us the most beautiful, perfect example of what discipline was and what chastisement was when he allowed his son to be crucified upon Calvary's cross, that wasn't to punish him. That was so that you and I could experience salvation in this life. A father, a mother who disciplines their children with corporal punishment in a loving way is doing it in a perfect reflection of God's love for his children. And that's why it's under such attack today. And it's so sad that so many in the church, so many young families have fallen prey to earthly sensual wisdom of psychology today. And, and again, does it matter in the moment? You go, absolutely, but you're not going to see it in the moment. That's the danger. You're not going to see it until what? Until your kids are grown. And maybe you won't see it until they have their own kids because, again, what we're seeing in society is what a downward spiral. Can we truly say that life is 
getting better? Are we saying that people are, are better? I mean, you want to say that, you know, but it's not true. Again, the heart of man hasn't changed since the Garden of Eden. The heart is deceitful. It's wicked above all things, and who can know it? Our works are like a filthy rag, the Bible declares. But we don't want to hear those things, but they're true. Hebrews 12, 6 speaks of the word chasten and nurture, and it implies discipline. It says, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son in whom he receives. And again, it's the dads who are called here to provide this loving discipline, to provide this godly instruction. You think of why. Proverbs 29, 15 says it best. The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. I wasn't afraid of my mom, I want you to know. I was afraid of my dad. My mom, she goes, I'm going to get out the yardstick. You know, we'd get free yardsticks. You know, they, well, they gave those out. You'd go to stores, and they always had some giveaway. She'd hit you with a yardstick. That thing would shatter like a baseball bat, you know, and, and we'd run to first. And, you know, and it, didn't, it didn't stop us at all. But, man, as soon as my mom said, I'm going to tell your father, it was like, no, mommy, please, you know, I'll, I'll do anything. You know, just be good. I can't do that. <laughs> anything but that psalm 51 5 says behold i was brought forth in inequity and in sin my mother conceived me so you can look at your mom you'll see mom my problem is you <laughs> you you did this you know we need loving correction you know proverbs 13 24 it says he who spares again his his rods hates his son but he who loves him disciplines him promptly Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Again, though our children, uh, they may resemble us. God created your child in his image. And our responsibility as fathers is to help our kids grow, to understand who they are in Jesus. And that's what the end of that in verse 4 goes on. It says, the admonition of the Lord. It means to talk to your kids constantly about the Lord and the things of, of God. But you can't share what you don't know. If you're not seeking God and you don't know God, how are you going to share God with your children? You know, it's been reported that the, on average, dads have less than 30 seconds of meaningful conversation a day with their children that live at home. 30 seconds a day of meaningful conversation. And again, can we change that? Absolutely. Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7 says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk to them when you, you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You know, help your kids, you know, dads, discover who they, uh, again, not just who they were created for, but why they were created. Colossians 1.16 says this. It says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. So you have gifts as a dad. Your children have gifts if you're in the Lord today. No greater joy than discover why God put you here on this planet. Amen. I mean, I think your kids, they're here for a purpose. 2 Timothy 1.6 says, Therefore I remind you, he told this to Timothy, Paul the apostle did, stir up the gift of God which, you, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. There's no greater blessing in this life as a, as a child. I can tell you this, when my dad would put his hand upon me, where he would physically touch me and pull me close and hold me and proclaim a blessing over my life, I can, I can remember those things from the earliest points in my life, even to as a man, when my dad would proclaim that blessing. And Paul, to the young Timothy here, he's going, you know, stir up that gift that's in you. And that's our job. What a privilege it is. And it doesn't make any difference how old our children are. It's a blessing. It's a privilege. It's a responsibility. I love that old saying that says, I'd rather go hunting with my son today than go hunting for my son tomorrow. You know, time, spending time with our kids, proclaiming that blessing creating a legacy that lasts, teaching our children who they are in Christ. That's not hard work in that respect. It's, it's a joy. I mean, when it's, you know, someone, we say this of work, right? They go, if you love what you do, you'll never work another day of your life. And you know what? If you love your kids, it's not really work. It's an investment, and it's a beautiful investment, you know, to, to be able to celebrate Father's Day, you know, with my own son today. And to look at, you know, our oldest son, you know, Brett, and be able to see, you know, the man that he's becoming, 
and to see what God has done in his life and to see what a wonderful job his mom did uh, in, in raising him. Um, it is. It's just a, it's a tremendous blessing. I mean, we could not be more proud. I mean, it's what makes Father's Day exciting, not for me in the sense for me, but to see what God has done uh, in the life of our kids. And every father can enjoy that. And I pray that you do. And the way that you can do that, and I close with this, is of all the things that you can do today. You know, and I look out and I know some of your stories, and some of your stories are hard. Products of divorce, you know, extenuating circumstances in the life of your kids that you're living estranged from today. You have no relationship with them whatsoever. And that's not your heart. I know that. And, and my heart, it hurts for you because that's not the way that God intended it to be. And you might be here thinking, man, Mike, I, I would love to do all those things, but I don't have the opportunity. See, what I love about God is God always makes a way, doesn't he? When it's of God, the world can say it's impossible, but what's impossible with man is possible with God. And the one thing that I know that you can do today, and I pray that you begin to major on it, and it, it will change your life, and it will impact the life of your children. I can promise you this. I, I promise you with all my heart, it works, and it will make a difference, and it's the word prayer. See, prayer can't be bound. Your kids can be living apart from you, I told the story one time, you know, where I got in an accident on my bicycle where a skateboarder came off the, uh, onto the bike path and fell down in front of me, you know, and I ran him over with my bike. I mean, just literally, I mean, actually, I hit him with my head. Uh, he was running. He, he just, he did it on purpose, which is an unfortunate thing, but he was trying to scare us, and unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. And uh, I hit him, and he went flying, and I stopped, and we were all laying on the ground, and we got up, and you know, got our bikes and stuff, and I went over to him, and I said, hey, you know, are you okay? And he was, you know, hurting in pain, and I said, hey, I go, we're all Christians. I said, could we pray for you? And he goes, no, no, I don't want prayer. And then we learned that he, he had done it on purpose. He was trying to shoot his skateboard at us to cause, you know, people. He was been doing this, you know, uh, tormenting people on the bike path, and it just so happened that it just didn't work out that particular time. He slipped when he went to shoot his skateboard, and he actually ran right in front of me and, and like I said, I ran into him, you know, but I put my head down and hit him, you know, pretty hard as we uh, came around this corner. But he didn't want me to pray. And I told him, I said, well, that's okay. I go, what's your name? And he said, you know, told me his name. And I said, well, that's okay. I go, we'll just pray for you anyway while we're driving, you know. And I said, just be careful. And we did. So we got up the road and we stopped and we prayed for him. And I thought, you know what, you can't stop someone from praying that wants to pray. If you're a dad here today, you can pray for your kids. And it's powerful. See, you have a, a father in heaven who does what? He's preparing a place for you, but he also, he's praying for you. You'll never be more like God than when you pray for your kids. Not because they're being nice to you or they lavish you with gifts or anything else. It's because you have a father's heart. That your heart's desire is that your kids would be reconciled to your heavenly father and to you. Never give up on that prayer. Job said this, and uh, we'll close in prayer. He said, so it was when the days of feasting had run their course and that Job would spin and send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. It says, for Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And thus Job did regularly. So not even knowing, because Job's kids didn't live with him. But every morning Job got up and he offered sacrifice for his kids. No one can stop you, Dad, from offering sacrifice for your kids. And I think what a great privilege that is for us to stand in the gap. And one day, maybe it'll never get fixed, the sight of heaven, but one day to be able to see them in heaven. One day to be able to be reconciled to them, knowing that you're going to be reconciled for not a few years or moments in time, but for all eternity. Amen? Nothing will compare to that. And may that... Uh, bring you strength and bring comfort to your hearts today as you celebrate this Father's Day. And may it be a blessing to you. Let's pray.